Hello everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. Spot is on. The Science Public Online Talk Series brought to you by the Faculty of Science at the University of Manitoba. My name is Samar Safi Har, Faculty of Science Lead for Equity, Diversity and Community. On behalf of the faculty, I welcome all of our viewers joining us online today. Today's talk is by Dr. Susan Cooper, joining us from the Department of Mathematics at the University of Manitoba. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge first that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thanks to support from the Faculty of Science, as well as of all of our invited speakers, this series was created to support all of our students, engage and connect with our community, and hopefully reach out to everyone through science during these unprecedented times. Science knows of no borders. Science is enriched by our diversity. In light of all of the crisis happening around us, the pandemic, bias, and racism that continue to harm segments all across society, especially the vulnerable, underprivileged, we hope that science helps us cross these boundaries support each other and stand in solidarity to support those hurting. In order to reflect and pay respect to those being oppressed, I would like us all to pause with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. Now to the talks. So these are meant to be brief, 20 minutes long. So please stick with us till the end. The question and answer period will be likewise about 20 minutes long. And to enter your question, please go to slido.com and enter the event code K873. Feel free to enter your questions throughout the talk. I'll be moderating and reading out the question. You can enter your name if you choose to or choose to remain anonymous. If you have any questions or face any difficulties, please send an email to andrewkapil at humanitoba.ca. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Susan Cooper is an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics at the U of M. She completed her undergrad at the University of Regina and received her master's and PhD from Queen's University. She's passionate about sharing the joy and beauty of mathematics, a discipline that's at the root of sciences. Her research area explores the intersection of algebraic geometry and commutative algebra. Susan describes herself as a BROG, B-R-O-G, type mathematician. That term is a hybrid between a bird and a frog. And where did that come from? Apparently, theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson once categorized mathematicians as being roughly two types, birds and frogs. The bird is the big picture type mathematician who flies over the mathematical landscape looking for ways to learn concepts from different areas, whereas the frog is the more detail-oriented mathematician who worries about the details of specific problems aiming to find a solution to each. So as a hybrid, I guess Susan is both. And her talk will be about the strength of a secret. Dr. Cooper, welcome. Over to you. Well, thank you very much to everyone who uh, decided to join us on a Friday afternoon. And thank you to the Faculty of Science for organizing this lecture series and for the invitation to talk today. As mentioned um, in the introduction, I am a mathematician and, and I work in the area of algebra. And in doing so, I handle a lot of abstraction. So I would like to emphasize three points in this presentation. First, I would like us um, to realize that abstraction allows us to solve real life problems. Second, that abstraction allows us to study problems using different approaches. 
And finally, that abstraction can be beautiful in its own right. Now, the, the application that we want to use today to motivate the talk for the real life problem has to deal with coding theory. And coding theory deals with the study of properties of codes, which many of you will think of as sending and receiving secret messages. There are lots of reasons for, for why people would invest a lot of time, energy, and money into um, such study. One such reason is national security. Certainly countries would want to talk to their allies in confidential and secure and safe fashions. And the second one, um, just to name a few, would come from, well, you, the audience. So I'm going to bet that at least one person in the audience has purchased something today with their credit card online. And we would want banking institutions and businesses and our computers to be able to deal with that confidential credit card information that we have so that we can feel safe and secure in how uh, we are conducting businesses. Another um, example where we might be interested in studying coding would be two-way communication between two friends, or in this case for this talk, two brontosauruses at the suggestion of my five-year-old son. So what we're gonna have is we're gonna have brontosaurus number one and brontosaurus number two. And they're gonna be having a conversation while eating some tasty leaves because they're herbivores. And they would not be overly thrilled if and there was an introduction of a predator who could intercept their communication. So in this talk, we're gonna have a T-Rex for our predator um, full disclosure that my five-year-old also recently told me that brontosauruses and T-Rexes don't didn't live at the same time. So my apologies for the, the dinosaur enthusiasts. Um, but what we want to talk about is how the two brontosauruses could set up an example of what we call a linear code in mathematics. So before they even get started in their communication, what they have to do is decide on a translation key. So they're going to choose in this example that we're going to use 26 um, letters from the English alphabet and three punctuation marks. To each letter and punctuation mark, they have to assign a number. So there's 29 symbols in their alphabet. So we are going to go ahead and we're going to assign A to the number one, B to the number two, and so on and so forth. We'll get down to 28, but it is typically, for mathematical reasons, handy to have a zero. So the exclamation point is going to be assigned zero. So we have 29 numbers there. So that's how they're going to translate their um, alphabet. And then once they translate it to a number, they're going to want to encode that number. The way that they've decided to encode it is to multiply the number by three. Now you have to be a little careful here because we have numbers in our translation chart, such as 26, such that when I multiply 26 by three, I get a number that's not seen in the chart. It's too big, it's bigger than 28. So what do we do in that case? Well, we have to um, use what we call modular arithmetic in math. So for the letter A, we're gonna assign it the number one, and then we're gonna add to it 29. This is because we have 29 numbers in that previous chart. We'll get 30. Add another 29 and you're gonna get 59 and so on and so forth. So any number that can be written as one plus a multiple of 29, what we're gonna do is we're just going to treat it as if it is the number one. We'll do that for B as well. B had, was assigned the number two, add 29, you get 31, add another 29, you get 60. So any number that can be written as two plus a multiple of 29 is gonna be treated as if it's just the number two. And you're gonna do that for the entire um, alphabet in your, in your uh, setup. Okay, so that's how we're going to encode by three. Let's look at an example. Let's suppose that brontosaurus number one has had a lot of leaves to eat. And so he's gonna wanna send um, the word water. To do so, he translates his W to, it's a corresponding number. W is the 23rd number in the alphabet. And then he multiplies 23 by the number three to encode it. There you get the number 69, which can be written as 11 plus a multiple of 29. So we treat that output 69 as the number 11. So W is translated to 23 and then encoded to the number 11, which you can see down below in our chart. And you would do this for each letter in water with an exclamation point. 
So here I've done the work for A. A was the first number I multiplied by three and it gets encoded into the number three and so on and so forth. Well, one of my um, goals was to emphasize that we can look at things in different ways in mathematics and doing so we can look at the analysis of a problem with richer information. So here we take water, we translate it to this string, six, a string of six numbers, and then we encode it by multiplying by three. We're gonna use um, fancy math uh, notation and call this output vector or output sequence a vector. So 11, three, two, 15, 25, and zero. Well, how did we get the 11? The 11 came from looking at 23 and multiplying it by three. How did we get the three? We had the number one and we multiplied that by three. So you do this for each entry in that vector. Well, there's another way to rewrite that. I'm gonna take this vector and I'm gonna kind of decompose it and pull it apart. So if you focus on just the red part, the three times 23, I'm gonna pull out the 23 and then I'm gonna record that I had multiplied it by three, but I'm, since I wanna pull this apart, I'm gonna keep all the other five entries of my vector as placeholders by putting zeros. Then I'm gonna move over to the three times one. Pull out the one and notice that this is um, in the second component of a vector and multiplied it by three, zeros for placeholders everywhere else. And you do this for every possible um, digit or number in the set um, vector of six entries. Well, we can write that more compactly by taking out the numbers that we pulled out, making them a vector, and then the vectors that we have with just three in one spot and zeros everywhere else, we make them the rows of an array, and we call this array a matrix. Okay, so what's important to note with this viewpoint is that our coded word is just linear combinations or combinations of the rows of this matrix. So we're focusing on the rows of this array. There's nothing overly special about the message water. I could have taken any six entries and I could have written it as that six entries in my vector and linear combinations or multiplication of this array. This array is called the generating matrix and it's really controlling how we find our coded messages. That is an example of a linear code. A code word, that's all of your outputs, is gonna be any non-zero linear combination of the rows, just like we had on the previous slide. So let's see what we can do with that T-Rex. Let's suppose that T-Rex introduces an error. He's gonna intercept Brontosaurus number one's message and he's gonna send the encoding for Wasser. So in Wasser, he changes the T to an S. And our question is, can Brontosaurus number two decide if this is what Brontosaurus number one intended to send? Another question that we could ask is, can we measure the distance or the difference between Wasser and the nearest English word? And so to look at these problems in a mathematical way, we introduce a number, which we're gonna call D, and its formal name is called the minimum Hamming distance of our linear code. And what it does is it gives us a lower bound on the distance. The larger the number is, the stronger our code is because we have more room or distance to decide the difference between what was sent and any error that might have occurred. So we'll come back to our water example with the dinosaurs and we'll look at the definition precisely. The minimum Hamming distance is the minimum norm of a code word. These are just vectors x which are non-zero. Well, what is the norm of our vector x? It's simply the number of coordinates in our vector which is not zero. So coming back to our example, Brontosaurus number two received the vector 11, three, two, 15, 25, and zero. There were six entries in that vector, five of them are non-zero, and so the norm of that vector is five. But remember that our minimum Hamming distance is determined also by looking at the rows of our generating matrix. In particular, if a code word is any linear combination of the rows, then a row by itself is considered a code word. So if you look at any one of the rows in this generating matrix, we have only one non-zero entry. And so indeed, for this example, our minimum Hamming distance is the smallest of these norms, which is one. Okay, so that's about looking at the problem of linear codes by looking at the rows 
But what we want to do now is we want to change our lens, the viewpoint that we're looking at this. And we're going to look at this by now changing to focusing on the columns. So suppose we have a linear code and I've written down its generating matrix here. What you'll notice is that I've color coded this. The columns in red are all the same. And then I've got the next two columns in black. They're equal to each other and the columns in green as well. It turns out that if you look at the columns, those entries are coordinates for points in a, a weird geometric lens. I call it weird because many of you may not have been exposed to it yet. We'll talk about that in a moment. But the number of times that you see the row, that see the columns, that is going to be your multiplicity of that point or the multiplicity of that column. So our question now is, or our approach is, can we bound the minimum Hamming distance of a linear code using algebraic and geometric properties arising from points in this new geometric land? And the new geometric land is called projective space. So to understand what projective space is, what you do is you look at your Euclidean plane. And if you haven't heard of those words yet before, what you're going to do is you're going to picture yourself standing in the field of the prairies of Manitoba. And anywhere on that ground, you can see infinitely in any direction, but you do stick on the flat ground. That is your Euclidean plane. And in that Euclidean plane, if you were to draw two lines, they're either going to cross each other or they're not gonna cross each other. They're gonna be what we call parallel. So historically what happened is we wanted to make that a simpler situation. So what we did is we added points to that plane and we added them in such a way that we added points to the lines and we declared that if the two lines never did cross each other, well they do in this new geometric land and they cross at a point called at infinity. So projective space is a fantastic geometric land because it's kind of of what you see is what you get. And so now if you stand at the back of trail railway tracks, what you're going to see, even though we know that they never cross, is it looks like they are now going to cross. So I'd like to close by just giving you an idea of what um, can happen in this new perspective. So if you focus on the code, uh, linear code here with generating matrix, Notice that I don't have any repeating columns. And so I have what I call a simple um, set of points. And just forget about that last row of ones. That's a formality for projective space if you don't already know it. But if you look at the first three columns, you'll see some uh, numbers in purple. Zero, zero is a point in Euclidean space. One, zero is a point in Euclidean space. And two, zero is a point in Euclidean space. And we have a way of kind of plotting coordinates for those points. And if you do that, you're going to get that they all lie on a line. And I've color coded that with purple. They lie in a horizontal line, H1. And similarly, your last three columns, those are going to give you points that are colored black in this case. And they're going to happen to lie on another horizontal line, H2. And so a result of Tovenu and Van Tool says that if you look at the minimum Hamming distance for the code with this generating matrix, it's bounded by taking the number of horizontal lines, minus one, times the number of vertical lines. Whenever you are able to do this and you get a grid-like um, formation, a box, if you will, okay? And so what was important in improving this result? Well, it turns out if you take the product of these two horizontal lines, let that be F, and the product of these vertical lines, let that be G, then those are two polynomials, and those two polynomials have no common factor. So by switching our viewpoint to columns and using algebraic and geometric information, we're able to classify or bound the minimum Hamming distance of a family of linear codes. Now, what I'm gonna do um, in the next slide is I'm gonna take the exact same set of points and I'm going to repeat the columns for all of the columns but one. So I'm going to add multiplicity. So I've taken away um, the, the labeling of the pictures there, but you can see that the first two columns are the same, the next two columns are the same, and so on and so forth, but not that last column. It's different. So I've added a bit of fattening or multiplicity to the points, except for that skinny one there in the corner. I still have my horizontal and vertical lines. And in this case, Tovano and Van Tool conjectured that we can yet again bound the minimum Hamming distance. How do we do it here? Well, I, I repeated each column twice, so I'm gonna, that's my purple multiplicity too. 
I'm going to take that two, multiply it by the number of rows, add to that the number of verti uh, vertical lines that I have, subtract the multiplicity again, and then subtract off two. Then I get a further bound here. Um, and indeed, this is going to be true in general whenever I have multiplicities added in such a way. And for our last example, I'm going to look at something that's a little different. I'm going to look at um, what I call a star configuration. So this star configuration has a very large uh, generating matrix for its associated code. But what you want to pay attention to is that I've got five lines. And how do I get my points? I take the intersection of any two lines. Then what I do is to each line, I'm going to add a multiplicity. And the multiplicity has to be two times something. So in this case, it's two times one everywhere, except for one point. It gets something special for a multiplicity. It's two times something plus a number, OK? And those multiplicity, remember, in your, in your generating code for your, um, your, the generating matrix for your code, these multiplicity are telling you the number of times you have these uh, these columns repeated. So this is a very large matrix. And in this case, Tovano and Ventoul uh, were able to conjecture a bound on the minimum Hamming distance. And the student who visited me last year um, from Lyon, Emilien Zabeth, he and I showed that you can achieve this conjectured bound. You, What you do is you take a, um, one, which is two times the one for our, most of the multiplicities, and you times it by uh, the five lines minus one, five lines minus two. That's going to give you an exact equality on that minimum Hamming distance. And then you have this bound, which is also color coded. So in summary, what have we done? We've looked abstractly at a, at a real life problem. And the real life problem was looking at the minimum Hamming distance of linear codes. How strong was the code? The larger that minimum Hamming distance, the better your code. And we were able to use different viewpoints. We started by looking at the rows of our generating matrix, and then we switched the viewpoint to looking at columns and how many times a column appeared in order to get bounds on that minimum Hamming distance. So it was the different viewpoints which allowed us to look at this and have a better analysis. And indeed, we got beautiful results by just doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, and thank you for sticking to your time despite <laughs> all the technical difficulties that we faced. I hope everybody's still with us. Uh, so uh, please enter your questions on slido.com, event code K873. Um, and so maybe while waiting for the questions to come in, uh, Susan, I'm curious for, uh, you know, for the youngsters that are listening to you and they are fascinated by mathematics, maybe you could tell them how did you get into this and, um, you know, what do you see that excites you the most about uh, applications of what you're doing to the real world? Uh, so it's a kind of a funny story how I got into mathematics, actually. I have an older sister who is a biologist, um, and she's working in California. And uh, she named me, actually. She gave me my name, and I think oh, she's going to kill me for saying this, but I think that um, she, she kind of took that as she got to uh, control me. So I, I went through a lot of different uh, majors of, as an undergraduate. One of them was uh, performance theater. Uh, and I, I was very artsy. And then my sister pretty much told me she wouldn't talk to me again unless I didn't try mathematics. And so I tried mathematics and indeed, um, I, I just really enjoyed uh, the ability to think through things. And, and I had a very good, lovely support group at the time. And so I think that made a, a huge difference. Um, but I am a pure mathematician by training, and so the algebra and the geometry that I do are, is typically very abstract. And so the coding theory is probably one of the uh, better, more concrete ap um, applications that I have. And I'm certainly trying to branch out a little more. Um, but uh, there's a group of us who are also trying to look at something called Hadamard products, which has applications in statistics and uh, physics. So I think. It's one of those disciplines where you really have to allow yourself to branch out and, and learn lots of new things to um, to do the real world applications. Okay, thank you. 
Um, a question coming from Sobi. Uh, online communication is sometimes hacked successfully despite supposedly safe encryption methods. Is that because of the weakness of the encoding or by luck? I'm having trouble reading the questions. I don't know if we can make them larger for me or you can repeat the question. Yeah. Um, so I'll repeat. Online communication is sometimes hacked successfully despite supposedly safe encryption methods. Is that because of the weakness of the encoding or is it by luck? I would say it's both. Um, so so cer certainly uh, the, the more work you've put into making it a secure um, encryption system is, is helpful. Uh, but with many things in life, including research, sometimes you luck out, uh, I guess, um, in the, in the, it's unlucky if, if it's your code, but if it has been hacked, I guess that you're, you're potentially feeling lucky, but some people are lucky and some people are very good at guessing patterns from other people. Um, so I would say it's a mixture of both. Thank you. Thank you. A question from Adam KS. Is it easy to guess the code used by a bank or credit card company? I hope not. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I actually don't know the answer um, precisely to that. I would, I would hope not, right? They're, they're, very, they're probably spending, in fact, they are spending significant amounts of money making sure that their codes are not able to be um, Hacked. That said, the day we went under lockdown for COVID, my own credit card was hacked uh, and somebody uh, bought a lot of Starbucks off of my credit card. So, I mean, it does happen, um, but uh, they have a very invested interest in making sure that they've done their best to, so that it doesn't happen. Okay. Um question. I hope I understood the use of matrices properly since one could use a matrix for generating the code of a given vector, are inverses of those matrices required as the other end would need to decrypt it? Um, so uh, is it required? Certainly handy <laughs> to have. Um, I, so linear codes are um, not the most complex codes to be looking at, but if you start getting into things like RSA encryption and what like, um, you're going to have to undo what you've what you've done to encrypt the code, and so that is the idea of the inverse. Yes. Okay. Um, a question from Laplace Transform <laughs> took your abstract linear algebra course 1.5 years ago. I'm wondering, uh, is linear algebra related to functional analysis? Well, in my opinion, linear algebra is related to pretty much everything. Um, it, I didn't actually, as a student, I did not like linear algebra. I'm going to be honest. Um, in fact, it made me uh, change majors for a little while out of mathematics. And I realized after some time that every time I tried to go back into mathematics, I was having to deal with ideas from linear algebra. I think it's one of the most critical and crucial courses you can take. Um, even though you may not see the beauty of it right away. Um, and so, yeah, it's there's there's relationships there. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, is there any different approach other than matrix theory to this problem? So if you mean the problem of linear codes, I mean, the idea was matrix theory. So. I, I, yeah, so if you look at the talk again, so near the end, you'll notice that we were using the points in projective space and their multiplicities. So if you deep down, and I didn't go into the details because there's not enough time to go into those details in a public lecture, but if you go deep down into that, we're not necessarily focused on the matrix itself, but we're looking at the properties of the points and they're very geometric and algebraic. All right. Uh, next question, does your work include dealing with protecting against the code cracking that quantum computing hopes to eventually decrypt? How might, might it apply to this field? So my personal work does not, unfortunately, um, deal with that. So I can't, it's a great question, but I don't think I can handle it with um, the uh, 
to the to the level that you're looking for. Mine is just uh, so my approach is really or my intention is to just get these bounds on the Hamming distance, and I, I leave um, the quantum to the quantum experts. All right, so that's it for the questions. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, great questions. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Susan, uh, for being with us today and sharing with, uh, sharing your work with us. Um, so uh, I guess the next uh, thing I'd like to say is what's coming up next. So if we can switch to my screen. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure to thank again uh, the Faculty of Science and the support uh, team for the SPOT series for their hard work uh, bringing this together. And of course, all of our speakers, including uh, Susan, who are uh, without whom this would not have been possible and for helping us make this accessible to everyone uh, around the world. Uh, our next speaker who may be familiar to many people is Dr. Jim Peebles, the 2019 Nobel Laureate in Physics uh, and originally from Winnipeg. Uh, so he's going to talk to us uh, next Friday on the lessons on, on the nature of physical science from the study of the expanding universe. So I hope to see you all and more. Please pass the world to your friends, colleagues, and everyone who would be interested. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that these uh, talks will be available for later viewing. Um, they are posted on the Faculty of Science uh, YouTube channel, so feel free to watch anything you have missed uh, or you might miss in the future. So thank you everyone, have a great weekend, and hope to see you next Friday. Bye for now. Bye, Susan.